you're not the sum of your mistakes or the sum of your experiences. You're the sum of what God has created you to be. And that's why I said Christianity is important. So now when you when you go back, <laughs> when you've lost everything, lost money, social standing, the works, ne? Uh, you don't even have money to go check yourself into a, a <laughs> mental facility. <laughs> There's no money. <laughs> But you know you should, but you don't have the resources <laughs> to do so, <laughs> you know? And you don't even have money to buy a time. <laughs> Nothing, zero. A former CEO. A former CEO. <laughs> 700 million. Pelile, man. Pelile, Amil. You don't have it. Then you must make a phone call. They say, what must happen now? Welcome to another edition of Mindset Profits. This is an exciting conversation I'm bringing to you. Conversation with the CEO and I'm with my friend Leo, who has been a CEO in a couple of organizations. So we're going to go deep in this conversation on what the life of a CEO looks like, how it impacted relationships. We'll touch a bit about marriage because I know all you entrepreneurs, sometimes when you go through life, it affects business when you go through work and try to balance work and life. It gets to touch a lot of aspects of your life in general. So we're going to get into all of those things. And most importantly, the reason why I'm bringing this episode is I want entrepreneurs to learn how to network. I want entrepreneurs to learn how to delegate, how to let people go. Leo has a nice way of calling, firing which is not firing, but we'll get into that. All this and so much more, but as we, without further ado, let me introduce the man, Leo. Welcome to the podcast. Tim, thank you for having me on your <laughs> podcast. And uh, also thank you for your listeners and viewers uh, watching our show. Um, I've been CEO of three companies. Uh, mm -hmm. The first two, uh, I was employed as a CEO. And the third one is a company that I've established. Um, I'm curious, when you were in high school, did yeah. you have a vision or a dream of becoming a CEO or this is just something that caught a bug that you caught along the way? You know, interesting, when you mentioned about high school, I've always seen myself as an industrialist, right? Owning, similar to a pit vest, owning companies across a plethora of sectors, you know, from mining to logistics to manufacturing um, and the like. So I've always seen myself doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't sure whether it would be in a form of being a CEO or part of the executive team or being an owner and all of that. So that wasn't really clear in my mind, but I knew that I wanted to play in that particular space. So, And that, that vision was engraved in me at a very young age. Um, you know, I, I frame myself from my Christian uh, upbringing, mm -hmm. um, and it's an important aspect of who I am. I may have lost the way sometimes along my journey, uh, or at times rather along my journey, but you'd always come back. I'd always regress to the mean, you know. Always that, you know, that the word of God was my plumb line, you know. So even if I go astray, it would pull me back, you know. So that's that's a definite important part that I need to highlight around who I am and what I'm about. Um, also for me in university when I joined the Student Representative Council, Mm. And uh, so we, we were heavily involved in student politics. And I remember when we were discussing after the election results came out and we were discussing who should be our top leaders, you know, the SRC president, the treasurer, deputy president and the like, you know. And at that point, I was very comfortable that I was just on the SRC and I was going to be the events um, uh, officer, if you may, you know. And through the pro and I was working with who I thought was going to be the SRC president, supporting him and lobbying and running around, sleeping late at night. Okay. And uh, from that conversation, over time, they said, "No, Leo, you must be the treasurer." I'm like, no man, are you guys crazy? I'm not ready to be a treasurer. It's my first year. What do I know about being a, a treasurer of 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 of, of, uh, of an organization? Right. I mean, what a one million rand budget at that time. Fairly small compared to other SRCs. But mm. it's a million rand that I have to provide fiduciary uh, services to you know, and be a steward of that money. And interesting enough, I, d I think I did an uh, exceptional job because we left the SRC1 with a surplus. Um, the contributions we gave to the finance committee were, 
were fairly good. And within my respective positions, by the age of 28, I was already a, uh, a director in government. Mm -hmm. uh, by 30, I was sitting on the Gauteng Tourism Board and had the privilege of sitting with people of the caliber of the, unfortunately, the late um, Kerklem Tembu, who played a key role in bringing Pepsi into South Africa. Um, David Mushapalo, who was part of SP, who's part of SPG, who've invested in Gauteng. Um, I just forget my colleague's name on the board as well. She was also a leader of BUSA at the time. So uh, the ability to sit <laughs> with such people at the age of 30. People you see on TV, you're sitting yeah. with them in a board meeting. And uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Kekia used to tease me with David Mushapal and say, ah, we didn't know we had an internship at the board, you know. <laughs> yeah, we've got Leo as an intern, right? But I, I learned from the feet of some really great men and women who framed me into being able to go through hardships because sometimes life uh, throws lemons at you or the rug is pulled under them. your feet mm -hmm. and you fall on the back of your head like what just happened here but you need to be able to rise again you know and that's what I'm saying by knowing your true north star so whether people want to tarnish your reputation tarnish your name or try and you know remove opportunities from you try to blacklist you blackball you you need to persevere through that. And that's why I'm saying that Christianity has played a key role because you need to see yourself the way God sees you mm. and then you're not a sum of your mistakes. Beautiful. Let's give some of the great men and women that you worked with some flowers. Yeah. What lessons do you remember any of them teaching you? Great. Great. This one came from who? So this one came from Kerklem Tim. Mm. He also taught me, said, Leo, when you work in the office of a leader, understand that you're not the leader, but you're there to support the leader and don't act as a gatekeeper. This point was also, um, this point was also re-emphasized by Jill Marcus when I worked at the Reserve Bank. Um, when I started at the Reserve Bank, uh, Jill Marcus was the governor at the time, and she made it very clear. Because she doesn't, well, they say she shouts, but I don't know, she never shouted at me. <laughs> But she pointed her finger and said, Leo, one thing you must never do, you must never deny me meeting anybody who wants to meet me. I will make that decision. You can make whatever recommendation you want, but make sure you do not block anyone, you know. And that taught me humility wow. because I had the privilege of working with uh, Jill Marcus. I got to know her. Uh, she got to know me. Um, I've also worked with uh, Lesecha Kanyaho as well. Mm. Uh, Kuben, I do, um, uh, and they were all teaching you all some things along they the way. They all taught me a lot. Very intelligent men and women, very ethical men and women. Um, they taught me the lessons of hard work, the importance of being diligent, attention to detail, and understanding technical processes. You know, one of the things both uh, um, Jill Marcus and Tate Kanyaho taught me was that the importance of accountability. They took their accountability seriously to account to the parliament, to both the select uh, committees of finance and the standing committees of finance. They made sure it's very important that we made sure that we had an opportunity to present our annual reports to those particular committees. Um, even when parliament would say, look, we're busy, or timeline is busy, or schedule is busy, they say, whatever you do, make sure. Mm. Where in, where we sit in those particular sittings so that we can report back an account to the representatives of South Africans. And I'm seeing it in the company that I'm running today. Um, it's helped me to, to remember the basic tenets that informed the direction that I wanted to take in my professional life. So that's why I'm saying for me that... Which one can you share? One of the experiences that you can think back to that taught you well... So I think the, yeah. So I think what taught me really well was the last uh, company that I was working for for 360 Life. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a life insurance business, mm -hmm. and uh, you know you're dealing, you're running a life business in a context of a one in a hundred year pandemic. Oh, and uh, it, it's going to hit your reserves. <laughs> uh, people are dying. You insure lives. You underwrite lives, right? And how I, the things I should have managed better in terms of communicating with the group uh, company, uh, the role that I could have played in helping to stave off 
some of the challenges around governance within the organization, um, the role that uh, we could have played in terms of raising capital to support the business as well. Uh, should have been a lot more proactive in managing that. Um, so you think you are not proactive? I think I, sh I didn't do enough. And, um, you know, um, I didn't do enough in terms of articulating and packaging the solution that I thought should have uh, been put in place or solutions. Um, I, was, um, I was too too relaxed in it when I look at it in hindsight mm. and allowing the group to drive the process as opposed to driving it myself mm -hmm. and if they disagreed with me then let that be the sword you follow right um, because as a leader you must be able to take um, responsibility when things go awry and then also take the responsibility of finding the solutions around that at the end of the day so you must lead from the front um, as opposed to saying, well, I've got a group structure, they must drive that particular process. And then where there's credit to be shared, let credit go to the team, not to you. Mm. Uh, not all the light should come to you in terms of when things are good, share the light. But Would you say that was right, the toughest you know, challenge you it was a had very to tough face so far yeah, as it's a been CEO? The toughest, it's been the toughest challenge that I've had to go through. It's, been a, it's actually it's been a life-defining moment for me, a definitely life-defining moment. Um, and remember, we are running a, because it's a very interesting thing for me when I reflect on 360 Live, right? Mm. In many ways, it's like food that's not microwaved properly. Some is piping hot, <laughs> some is frozen, <laughs> some is quite right, the temperature, all in one spoon, right? Because on the one hand, we grew the business massively on the top line. Yeah. 35% growth. Um, we, you know, we, we reduced costs significantly. Um, so even if you look at the costs from the previous year and the previous year before that, were well within. I mean, the cost was significantly lower. Top line was, was up. Um, I think we grew the business to, if my memory serves me correct, we grew it by about, as I said, 35%. We grew to about 720 million rent turnover business. So at a Ooh. decent run rate, you know. So it was a fairly large business. <laughs> but then at the, the first numbers. time, we are like, hey. <laughs> I'm no longer here, right? So I'm looking, yeah. obviously this previous work that has been done, I just built on work that has been done by my predecessors, right? It's not all yeah. me, but we also tried to, op not tried, but to optimize some of the license. It's important to life. say that, actually. Yeah, yeah. But then at the same time, then you've got the crisis that's there, you know? Um, so, and, and also not leaving ceremoniously, we left in a, in a conflict with, 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 a, with, with the, the group board. CEO, mm. not even the board, the group CEO, who's actually the one who recruited me to the organization. <laughs> and, and you reflect on that, right? And you say, look, well, now we're here, what's next? And, you know, you, you go through all the processes of grieving and you then have to get to a point and say, listen, what has happened has happened. You may feel hurt, you may have feel, felt betrayed, but at the end of it, you have to move from a position of forgiveness. Right? Because once you forgive, it heals you. It's not about the other person, because the other mm. person will move on with their life. Mm. Um, and once you then forgive, and then you say, well, what's next now? Right? And it's what I touched on earlier to say, you're not the sum of your mistakes or the sum of your experiences. You're the sum of what God has created you to be. And that's why I said Christianity is important. Then what do you do? How do I know what God thinks about me? So either I must read about it or he's going to tell me about it. Right? So, <laughs> so hasn't, I haven't heard his voice, him telling me about it, <laughs> so, but I've read about it. <laughs> <laughs> so reading about it, like, okay, cool. So can I start a financial services business? And the answer was yes. And I've started a, a financial services business. Mm. And I've been able to find some very big clients in the asset management industry. Uh, mm. across the suite of different asset classes, uh, fixed income, global and domestic, uh, domestic equity, global equity, some are South African, some are international, but we make sure that each category, they don't compete. Okay. Uh, very clear with tight Chinese walls, mm. good controls, good governance, because your biggest growth opportunities, it's where you have lessons to learn. That's where you're going to grow. Mm. You're not going to grow where you're strong. There's very, the increase is incremental. But where you had weaknesses, that's where the growth is going to happen. 
and that's where your blessings are going to come from. And that's where my blessings have come from now, you know. So the business Clearly. is established, it's working, and mm. we intend to grow it. Um, hopefully I'm you'll curious. make time with me to help me grow it. <laughs> I know, uh, we're here, we're here. We're here to add what we can add. Yeah. But I, I'm going to take you back a bit sure. to when they were saying we can't work with you anymore. Mm. You said you went through the stages of processing yeah. that, that now that we're here, what next? Yeah. What did that look like for you? How long did that process take for you? It took a couple of months because it was a very, it was a difficult one. It was, it was not a ceremonious, uh, you know, it was an <laughs> unceremonious. And that's using euphemism. <laughs> it was rough. It was rough. Okay. But when uh, it's rough, the tough get going. <laughs> Nobody's going to save you. Nobody's going to save you. So you pull yourself up, bootstraps and all, scars and all. And you're like, it's fine. I find myself here. I know what it... I know, and, and you know, sometimes when you come from poverty mm. um, and you overcome poverty, mm. uh, and I mentioned about grit that I learned from Okia Klem Tim, the late, mm. is that those are then the things that you go back to. And you remember who you are and what you've had to overcome to get to, to, where, get you to where you were. <laughs> so now when, you've, when you go back, <laughs> when you've lost everything, lost money social standing, the works. Né? Uh, you don't even have money to go check yourself into a, a <laughs> mental facility. <laughs> There's no money. <laughs> you can't, you know. <laughs> you can't do that, you know. But you know you should, but you don't have the resources <laughs> to do so. <laughs> you know. And you don't even have money to buy a time. <laughs> yeah, nothing, zero. A former CEO. A former CEO. <laughs> 700 million. Pelile, <laughs> man. You don't have it. Then you must make a phone call. They say, what must happen now? Say, okay, there's Rosebank Mall there. Wi-Fi is free. <laughs> <laughs> Wi-Fi is free. I'm going to vote Let's people go. on WhatsApp. <laughs> <laughs> Not because of any other reason, because <laughs> don't have air time. <laughs> There's no air time. But you uh, carry yourself as though you're running a one billion rand business. Okay. Ne? You carry yourself with that confidence. Because not about, and that's the importance, that people who are framed by their balance sheet, and mm. once that balance sheet goes, they are nothing. Confidence once that title goes, they are nothing. And they don't know how to bounce back. Mm. So my ability to bounce back it was because I never saw myself as my title, ever. You know, even when I was in government, you know, my colleagues would say to me, Leo, you'd walk with an MEC, but you still greet a cleaner. Mm. But I said, that cleaner is a leader in his or her community, number one. Number two is that I needed to see myself how God saw me. So reading the word of God helped me to be able to overcome that. Mm. That and I knew what I wanted, and I knew that the value that I had, that even though there was a fallout, mm. it doesn't mean that the people who recruited me there, who are the people who then got me out, that I don't have value. Mm. And the ability to, and that's why I say money is a store of value. Money is not value, and people don't understand that. Mm. And once you understand, and you know how to create value, mm. you will be able to bounce back. And that's why I'm saying that identity of knowing who you are outside of your position is very, very important. Yes, there is prestige that comes. There's resources that come. There's power that mm. comes with uh, a title. I'm not going to say it's not the case. Yeah. But that title should not be you because that title can come and go at any moment. You know? Beautiful. You know what I'm curious of? You, you have quite the beautiful teamwork with your wife. Yes. I'm curious to find out for you that period when you were still hustling and fighting it out after the job loss. How did that affect your relationship in any way or you have tricks and hacks? For, because there are many that go through these difficult times yeah. and it becomes the reason they get divorced. But yeah. you seem to be stronger and better. Not going through a divorce in that process. So, <laughs> so I've got no tricks. <laughs> I've got no tricks. I've got no tricks. Oh, so and when, this happened, a, when this happened, you had gone through a divorce. Yes, over and above this thing. So, and 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 the divorce. I'm not going to say the divorce was a result of 
of the job loss or whatever those things. We had our own issues with my with my then wife. True. Multiple issues, and it it, it culminated in that uh, in a divorce. Um, so uh, my current wife that you know, yeah, um, she has been a massive support pillar. It's what in I me, see in, yeah, in, in in me also being able to rebuild myself, and that's why I'm saying that. It's a gift of God. You know, I don't want to preach, and I'm sounding like a preacher now. <laughs> but, but it's important. In, you know, when, when the Bible says that uh, a wife is a gift from God, yeah, my current wife personifies that for me. I'm not yeah. going to speak for other men. Go deeper. Yeah? Because, you know, <laughs> yeah? because the support and encouragement that a wife gives, mm. and, uh, it's far more important than anybody else. Because she knows your ups and downs. You can't pretend to her. Yeah. You can pretend to everybody else. She sees, she knows what your strengths are. She knows what your weaknesses are. Mm. But somebody who can still uh, look beyond that and help you find your true north star, that is a gift. And mm. she's been very supportive in that uh, in many ways, and it's something that I have appreciated. So there are no tips I can so give. There are no man. tips for handling yeah. marriage and the hard times there. No, no, there, it, I, there I, I can't <laughs> give tips. I, it can't be from a practical <laughs> lens. It will be at a theoretical <laughs> lens, you know. And I think that in life, one must be able to understand where one wants to go at the end of the day and where one wants to be. And be able to look at a relationship to say, am I bringing out the worst in the person? And are they also bringing the worst out of me, you know? Mm. And, and, and as I said, you know, sometimes when you try and force things together, they might not work. So it's not that the other pe- my ex-wife is a bad human being. No, I'm mm. not going to speak ill of her in any shape or form. I've got no... I wouldn't expect you uh, to. Because there's no ill that if a relationship doesn't work, you can't now go start bad-mouthing somebody else. I'm not going to do that. It's unnecessary. Yeah, because true. there's nothing to bad mouth. It didn't work out. I've moved on. She's moved on. She's running her very successful career in the legal uh, thing and in the entertainment space, doing very well for herself in the arena. And I, I pray for her and for God's blessings and all the best for her. And equally so, I'm doing my, my thing in the financial services. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a business that's on the rise. Mm. I'm, I'm enjoying what I'm, when I'm seeing the pipeline and the opportunities that I'm building there. And I'm also glad that God has give, is a God of the second chance and has given me a wonderful wife that I can, I can do the rest of my life uh, with. So I know that my latter years will be better than my former. <laughs> uh, and I'm yeah, looking forward to that. And I, and I got it's to a, meet you. Yeah, I, I'm <laughs> incredibly blessed and yeah. grateful that I got to meet you too. Sure. So looking forward to all those cool holidays. Yes, same year, same year, same year. That we'll do together. Yeah. You know what? What you're saying, what's so beautiful about what you're saying is something that one of my mentors taught me, that since you have a podcast or you write a book, you can't use it as a platform to take revenge on anyone who hurt you, especially ex-wife. Sure. Because the other thing you should always know is there's two sides to your story. 100%. You know your side of the story. You don't know the other side. Maybe 100%. there are things that she, ex-wife, was seeing and feeling and experiencing that you're not aware of. No, no, 100%. I, mm. I fully agree <clears throat> with you that, you know, I think that for, for many people, uh, from my own observations, right, so I, mean, I haven't done a research on it as such, but just engaging with people who've gone through divorce and the like, from a, a guy's perspective. Obviously, I've not talked to many females about it, but many of them would feel very bitter and so forth. I'm like, but this is your perspective, as you said. Yeah. Your partner, your ex-partner also has a perspective. And and for me, is that uh, uh, I'm not one to say that, and it's not about me trying to make myself a bigger person. No, not at all. Is that it's not right to go speak about somebody else who's got no opportunity of right of reply. That's not yeah. one. And also number two is that there is no point in, in doing that because why is it taking you at the end of the day, you know? All you're doing is you're just prolonging the hurt. It's like when you remove a plaster of your skin, it's mm. quick to do it quickly once, and done. Mm. Instead of now bad-mouthing somebody else, it's, un- it's completely unnecessary. We've got children together. She's a decent human being. She's a good human being. The fact that our relationship didn't work out does not preclude that she's a good human being, you know. So, mm. 
and we, we've had our differences clearly. That's why we get divorced. Uh, mm. There was not be divorced. There are no differences, <laughs> right? And uh, as I said, and and she's got a thriving career. She's doing well in that career, and we wish nothing but the best for her in all her endeavors at a professional, emotional, and spiritual level. So no one is sitting there. <laughs> anyway, you know, you no know, wish her the best. You know, we've did got, you? We've got kids together, so mm-hmm. her success is also good for my kids <laughs> as well. So, so that way, you know what I mean. So if you are, maybe one may say that is a selfish element that the kids must be fine as well. You know. <laughs> So yeah, so you can't. I, I definitely agree with you on that. That that's not a an approach that I'd want to have. And I think also you don't want negative energy. And you know when you start bad people, you, yeah. it, 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 you become a negative person. No, who wants to be around a negative person? You know, mm. nobody wants to be around a negative uh, a person. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Is, did you get anyone mentoring or teaching you? about this phase of your life, the divorce phase, because the, yeah. a lot of what you're saying, I got to do, but later, because I got taught. When I was going through it, it was, there's a period of my life where I was so angry, but I talked to a really wise man that cares yeah. about me. He said a few things, in just a few sentences. One of them was, don't let your failure be your fail, the failure of your kids. Yeah. And what he meant, actually, he did explain it. He was saying, your child didn't ask to be born by the two of you. True. Because you two failed to make things work. Don't True. let your failure be her failure. Don't let her be a, a child that grows up fatherless. A sure. child that grows yeah. up without the support that she was going to yeah. get. She did not ask you to bring that her. That is true. Yeah. So in terms of... Um, so this co- I'm seeing counseling now uh, to help yeah. me with that as well. Uh, just also to, at a personal level to get to know who you are. Uh, and also how to support uh, the children in a context of not um, uh, being there on a day-to-day uh, yeah. uh, basis and the like. So I've not perfected it. It's, it's a work in progress, uh, to be honest. And it's something that counseling is helping uh, in many ways uh, to, to be able to be more present in that particular thing. The divorce certainly has taken a massive strain on the relationship with the children. Uh, and and I pray that by God's grace we'll be able to to find to fix that to too. fix it you know and even the the years or the months that we've lost can be mm. can be fixed you know um, so that's what I'm hoping for mm. um, and uh, you know one of the things when you're a CEO is that uh, and and I learned this from a CEO of, who is a CEO of a big telco company and uh, the privilege of getting to meet him through the school my child went to. And uh, he said, the biggest challenge you have as a CEO is that you don't have time. Okay. You don't have time. Your time is controlled. Your diary from the time you wake up is controlled by the office. Whether it's a dinner, a meeting, whatever the case may be. And you need to consciously try to carve out time. For, for your family. For your family and yourself. Okay. So, so it's very important, as back on the question that you've asked earlier on and around this particular podcast, is that you're going to be time-staffed. And you need to live a life by design and be intentional around making sure that you create time for yourself and your family. And time is not that you're busy with your phone. Mm. We'll say having this thing. Time is that there are no phones are involved. None, zero for the night. Whether it's five minutes or an hour, whatever time you can give, it must be undivided. And I think it's easy for us, uh, from my own experiences, it's very easy to get lost and thinking, you know, tomorrow will be better, but tomorrow is never better because you're not intentional. So you need to live your life by design. So for any new uh, CEOs or, uh, or people who want to become CEOs, they yeah. need to be intentional around time. How are you applying that lesson in your life now? I take midnight, uh, mid-afternoon naps. <laughs> I sleep in the week. <laughs> and I put the nap time in my diet. I'm sleeping. It's there, your diary. Yeah, I sleep. Two o'clock to three o'clock, I'm sleeping. Unless I'm picking up my daughter from school. I'm sleeping. Okay. I sleep because you need to recharge. Because you're working in a services industry. It's about making sure that your mind is fresh to come up with ideas and solutions to what your clients want. And if you're not in that frame of mind, you're not going to deliver what the client wants. We're going to produce subpar work. So you need to rest, you know. And then the point that you're raising earlier, which I must answer around to say, did you get counsel? 
oh, yeah. from all, uh, older people. I didn't get the counsel at the right time. So I spent a lot more time through my counsel at the time. Remember I said to him, because now yeah. you're busy uh, doing other things and then now your investments, you've disinvested because you're renovating <laughs> and all of that thing. So that pair, uh, <laughs> you're losing cars. Cash is the, gone. The well-bodied man coming to take their luxury German cars. <laughs> <laughs> That happened. <laughs> it happened. It happened, you know. Uh, and that's what I'm saying. You lost cars. I lost cars. Nice cars. I lost them, <laughs> but you know. <laughs> Goodness. But then you build again. You build again. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying, that the material things must never uh, frame you. Yeah. You know. But uh, what I did at that point, I had a couple of friends who said to me, look, Leo, you are here. You've hit rock bottom. There's only one way up. And you now <laughs> need to see yourself that way, that you are on your way. Don't even say you're on your way up. Say I'm already up. Okay. You know, sort of process. You're already there because if you don't. So this is the counsel you're getting now. Yes. Just from friends. Yes. For the most part. For the most part, it was from friends, a little bit from family as well. Um, uh, as also friends and family gave me that particular support, and I think that uh, it's important that you know, as I say, uh, I did a, a, tr- a course on trading. Uh, one time, proper trading, not this other one. <laughs> forex, proper, proper <laughs> trading, proper trading, <laughs> not forex. Uh, not forex. So, no, I'm not going to sell you a forex trade now. But the, the the guy said, if you learn one lesson and one lesson only, is that know the exit before you do the trade. Meaning, if you're going to buy a stock at a hundred rands, mm. and you say I'm going to sell it when it makes hundred and six, mm. when it makes a hundred and six, sell it. Don't wait and see. Maybe it will rail and become 112. Because you don't know if it will crash below 100 afterwards. So that's what, stra- that's what living a life by design helps you. You are intentional about what you're doing. You're not just moved by your emotions or your circumstances, right? Because mm, circumstances That's a change. beautiful lesson. Like if there's traffic and I need to get to Pretoria and the only way I can get is an N1, I'm going to drive through that traffic, through that air patch. And you'll find that the sun will shine. At the end of the day, there will be a storm, but the sun will shine the next day or the day after that. Mm. After winter comes spring. After spring comes summer. So life works in circles. You just need to plan better for those particular circles. And that's the learnings that you get when you go through bad experiences. You say, what can I learn from this? What role did I play? What should I stop doing? What should I start doing? Mm. What should I continue doing? You <coughs> need to take responsibility. You can't be a victim. Yeah? So I can't say, oh, is this one's fault? Is that one's fault? I must take account for my actions and my responses because that I control. I can't control anybody else. You know? um, so, so that's what Those I'm are beautiful to. lessons. When I'm curious about a couple of things, though, yeah. as, you, as a CEO. And yeah. One, what have you learned about leading teams? Sure. Especially teams that are not performing. It's a, you know, leading, <laughs> leading people is like herding cats. You know, it's like herding cats. It's not an easy process, you know. That's why some of my friends who are engineers say, hey, we don't like people, man. You can solve things for them, but there must be no people. The world would be a better place. They joke and say that. So what I've learned with teams is that it's good to get a common goal and common deliverables. And make sure that those deliverables are not uh, subjective, they're objective. Mm-hmm. So it must be clear. So if I must sell 100 widgets, it's 100 widgets. That's what I sell, right? Mm. Um, so, so my starting point with that is to say, guys, what are we seeking to achieve? And making sure that that seeking of achievement is objective. And we do it's that Something that we can measure. Something that we can measure. It's specific, it's measurable, yeah. it's achievable, it's a realistic target at the end of the day. And we build a consensus around that. How so, often do you have that conversation? So that conversation would have it uh, at the beginning of the year. So obviously you understand why the organization exists and all of that. But we say, mm. here's our five-year plan. Now let's break it down into chunks that we can understand. Right. So what are we going to do for the next 12 months? This is what we're going to do. That's in line with the reason why the organization exists. Okay. Then once we've then got that and we've got a consensus on that, that process of getting that consensus it's a highly engaging, highly consultative process. There's no title. There's no CEO. There's no CFO. It's us as a, as a team, as a top management team, C-suite, mm-hmm. people reporting directly to me. 
facilitate it, of course. I speak last because people sometimes forget to remove the hand. <laughs> and all casual, wear t shirts and jeans, no fancy suits, you all, like and all of that. T shirts and some who are fashion, Nisa no, no, leave your Philip plain t shirts at home, <laughs> no Gucci sneakers here, you know. <laughs> we then have that consensus. Once we've reached that consensus and we get to the point of contracting, and we then break down the contracting within your respective um, um, positions, right? Because everyone's got a responsibility to play as mm -hmm. per their positions. There's no more negotiation. Now, we're, they're not inspiring you here. Now, you must, <laughs> must come here and say, these are your deliverables. Are you delivering? Are you not delivering? What are the reasons? We have those hard conversations because it's not subjective. It's not that you don't like me or I had a bad day or not. Then it makes it easier to have the conversation. And because we've institutionalized it, everybody then understands, hey, that's a CFO's target. And you can find the CMO asking the CFO, CFO say, hey, CFO, you're not delivering your part. Then you can find HR asking marketing, you know, marketing, you have not done your stuff. What is the ROI <laughs> on the budget that you're spending? This was our number, but I'm not seeing the ROI. Why? Because everybody has been empowered. Everybody owns it as a team. Then we then say, how can we then help you? How can HR help you? Do you have the right people? Do they need training? What kind of training do they need? Because HR is aware of what is required. Finance is, is aware of what is required to say, okay, listen, we know we're supposed to do this big marketing campaign. Cash flow is not coming in. Sales are not delivering. There may be uh, legitimate reasons as to why they're not delivering. Yeah. But then the CFO can then play the part to say then, what do I then do? How then do I, uh, am I able to delay certain payments? Am I able to get payments paid quicker from some of my clients so that we can support that? So the process is really around making sure that you've institutionalized a process around what your targets, your deliverables are. From there, consensus building. Once that's then done, then it's a hard nuts and bolts of making sure that de delivery is happening. And for me, with all my teams, and how I've also wanted to be managed, and I've been proactive around that, I've never wanted to be surprised at a performance review. So that performance review, I knew I was going to get a five or a two. <laughs> yeah? Because I know what my deliverables for the quarter are. So when I come in there for the review with the manager, uh, they never lasted more than five minutes. None of them. Okay. Because we contracted it properly up front, and then I knew that I've delivered. And that is a portfolio of evidence. Up front, mm. so it's there. So this is a typical case of when things are going right. Yes. Have you had situations or had to deal with situations where things go wrong yes. and one department says the reason why I can't deliver is because of that department and they find a legitimate way of linking their failure to perform to a deliverable that someone else couldn't perform on? So you remember we talked about even in a relationship that <laughs> one has a story and another one has another side. So by virtue of us having regular engagements, yeah, is that we'll then be able to understand where are the bottlenecks and why things are going wrong. So if it's going wrong because of the team, there's variables within our control, yeah, we'd remove that before the delivery, the the review was happening because of the regular engagements. engagements. And as I said, that the deliverables would always be objective. Right? Now, in a context where we've got a one in a hundred year pandemic, where people thought, ah, it's only 21 days, today didn't to a grant. Six months later, you're still there. <laughs> that's slightly harder to, to control. Right? But from that experience, and that's what I'm saying, from that experience, what I've learned is to say that make sure that you always have sufficient reserves. Mm. Now the issue. Now some that's would, a lesson for Now some will say, so. "What is sufficient reserves? Is it?" Mm. Some would advise three months emergency funding. Some would say six months. Some would say a year. So what? What I found within that is to say, let's say at a personal level, mm. try not to buy a house which you're paying off in twenty years. Okay. Try buy a house that you can, if you can't pay it cash, at most paid off in five years. Try and mm -hmm. look. I must give my disclaimer. My comments should not be considered financial <laughs> advice. If you want financial <laughs> advice, please seek a qualified and registered financial advisor uh, before you get financial advice. I'm just sharing my experiences. So it's not financial advice in any shape or form. Yeah. Buy a car that you can buy cash. So if you can't buy a car cash, don't buy it. Because the like reason why, you know I'm saying that, in yeah. and, I, and I know I wanted to jump in, is I'm saying because when things go awry, the house is yours, the car is yours. 
Then you can go to the <coughs> municipality and say, listen, yes, I'm living in a nice suburb. I'm not disputing that, but I've lost my job. Or I've lost my, my company is going to be liquidated. Can we make an arrangement on subsidized rates and taxes? But they're not worried about paying a car, paying a bond, paying furniture, paying credit cards, contracts, cell phones, and all of that. We are locked in for two years. So you want, like any business, you want as much of You're your costs introducing costs a new term to be you. variable costs as much as possible and mm. not quasi fixed costs. Because 20 years, that's a fixed cost. I mean, I know the accountants who say it's not true, but effectively mm. it is 20 years. I mean, that's a long lead time, right? It's Five a years on a car. Time and a lot can happen. And now it's even seven years on a car, right? It's not, it's then the balloon payment post that. And that car has already had two phase. There's a facelift, new upgrade. There's an upgrade <laughs> to that facelift, and there's a new model coming. But now you're still paying for that car. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's just my experience. It's not for me to say. Well, uh, let's, yeah. let's leave it at something for you to think about. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yes, yeah. L viewers, please think about it and talk to a financial planner. <laughs> yeah, no, sure. I have a series with financial planners that's yeah. coming. Oh, um, wonderful. I think yeah. about four or five of them. Okay, look forward to listening to the podcast. So, different versions, yeah. and at least they won't have to do a lot of the disclaimers <laughs> they would need because to they are financial the financial right? planners that's it <laughs> they can't say look for financial planner because i i kept talking to people who gave sound financial advice but right. they still have to give that disclaimer yeah. to say look yes. for a financial advisor so i thought sure. why not i just talk to them and it's important you know because the whole face act that has been put in place is to make sure that we professionalize or, or the regulator fsca professionalizes the financial services industry mm. and make sure that people who get advice are getting it from people who are qualified and have gone through a process to be certified so mm. you know that the quality of advice becomes good. You know, I was sitting in a meeting with a, a CEO of a, of a large financial services house and he made something interesting, which I'm still thinking about. And he was saying, rich people remain rich because they get good financial advice. And he asked the question, Whoa. who's giving poor, the poor that good financial advice? Who is giving to Oh, them? can you repeat that? And that is you are saying rich solid. people remain rich and become richer because they get good financial advice. And then who is advising the poor? Who is advising a low-income earner? Who is advising someone who's getting a grant, you know, a child grant or the 350, uh, the COVID distress grant? Who's advising that person financially? Yeah. He asked that question. I don't have the answer for it, but it's something that I thought, this is very, No, very it's something to think about, definitely. Yeah, very, very interesting. Because, like, if you look at, if you've got unsecured debt, um, there's something that that's called credit life. Credit life that's typically issued by the finance houses is expensive. Mm -hmm. But you can get your own independent uh, credit life, which you could find is cheaper than this one, and you could save. That maybe no whatever the there. difference is, that difference you hoi it back into the loan, and it can help you to reduce how long you pay the loan and the interest on that because of the power of compound interest. And there is a quality of financial advice that I'm saying. Mm. A number of uh, low-income workers and so forth who've got unsecured debt, um, are they getting the best debt? Could they get debt better? How do they manage their money so that they improve their credit record and the like? Mm. They need that kind of advice. What, and also understanding the difference between saving and investment and all of that. And that's why I'm happy. I'm glad to hear that you're doing this thing on financial aid. Yeah, yeah, no. And people must listen coming. to it. They must yeah, listen to they it. Must. Yeah, yeah, they must. They must. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there. I'll be listening so, to it. So, uh, interesting. I, I was in Kenya yes. the last week. Yeah. So, I got on a podcast with one of the big podcasters there, and he was asking me about my perspectives on savings. Yeah. and investment so i i didn't know what way he was going with it but i answered the best i could one some of the examples i realized after when he gave me a response when i was done that i gave examples based on our context and the credit context that we have here this side and he, he was surprised at some of the things because he then says, you guys buy furniture and clothing on credit. And food. And food. <laughs> true. I said, yes, how, how do true. things work? Yeah, around? Yeah, how do things work this way? And yeah. he, he was shocked. Yeah, yeah. He said, no, that is not something that happens yeah. normally. <laughs> you buy it on what you can afford. We buy, we buy our staff cash. I think yeah. they buy more heavy capital 
purchases yeah. like cars and houses and stuff but yeah. for clothes and alcohol and <laughs> <laughs> and a night out with your and friends a night out, yeah. it's not credit for those yeah. but i guess it's going to be an exciting one to talk to financial advisors yeah. when you look at your role as a ceo i think i have two more questions for you what have you learned about firing people or letting people go So for me I don't see it as firing people I see it as releasing people to find their destiny. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's not for you here maybe somewhere else you know <laughs> and you can go find your destiny <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> so it's not fair and I'm not meaning it to be funny I, I, I generally mean it right because you know I I I've never understood the issue when people say they work in a toxic work environment and they can't leave. I'm like, why can't you leave? I say, how am I going to pay my bills? So I'm saying, but who said that your source is only your job? I don't, I can't speak about the Kenyan economy. I've even been, I've only read, out, I can speak a little bit about South Africa's economy. But if you are fired at an accounting firm, who says, you, oh, it's toxic, why can't you go work at another accounting firm? And that's what I talked about value is that the skill set that you must have because we live in a capitalist economy right rightly or wrongly yeah and the demand for labor in economics 101 by the first semester you're taught that the demand for labor is a derived demand whether you are a laborer or you are a white collar worker it's a derived demand it's in the producing of an, uh, something else that I need to hire you so I'm not hiring you as an end in itself the employee is a means to an end so what's important is that end is that you must now as in the person who's bringing in their labor mm. you must have a skill set that allows you to earn as much as you possibly can number one, and that, that skill is transferable and mobile so that if you find yourself in a toxic work environment do not bequeath the power and influence that you have to your manager or your boss or to the organization mm. such that Uh, I don't know what it is in English. It's almost like to give up is not doesn't sum it up properly. You surrender, you surrender yourself. <laughs> you know, you surrendered yourself to your boss and his or her whims. You must not allow that to happen to yourself. You must, and that's why I said you must live by design, such that you must live. So, so for me, and I always told my teams that I had a PA who I hired, and I told her, listen, if you don't leave my office in 12 months, I'm going to fire you. She was a receptionist, Whoa. and I told her, like, hey, I said, no, you can tell HR, I've said that, I'm putting it on record, that I'll fire you. And, and she said, why? I said, because you need to grow. I don't want you to be my PA for the next 15 years. Right? You must grow. Within nine months, she left to become a, to another substitute at the group level. I think she ended up being an assistant company secretary, being trained in that particular space. Right? Wow. Because for me, said, I want to see people grow. Unless there's a set of unique circumstances where they say, listen, Leo, I want to be able to knock off at four uh, and switch off my laptop and open it up tomorrow, okay, sharp. then that's also okay. But it must be a conscious decision that they have made, not me preventing them from growing. growing. So the only time I'll fire you is that if you're not performing. And we need to understand what are the reasons for your non-performance. Because remember, we've done the process jointly of agreeing what the targets are, and you've inputted in those things, and you've bought into the story. So that by the time when we contract, it's no longer consensus building. Now it's execution and expect delivery. So if you're not delivering and we don't understand why you're not delivering, clearly then this organization is not for you. Because high performance is necessary because we live in an economy where things are changing so quickly with technology. I've been playing with this generative AI. Mm -hmm. And I did a beach holiday advert in Zanzibar, uh, East yeah. of Africa, Noha. Uh, And the, within two minutes, I had a video, I had an advert that I could use to promote Zanzibar beaches in two minutes. Literally oh. in two minutes. And I'm not the most... Was that creative. before or after I was invited? Yeah. Now I'm curious. After, <laughs> after, after you're invited. Literally two minutes. And the point I'm making is that if we're not going to be high performers, constantly looking to see where can we be disrupted, or sometimes even disrupting our own model to remain relevant, we're going to fall by the wayside. And running a company, there's a social, there's a psychological contract that you have with your employees that you must make sure that they're able to earn money at the end of the month so they can sort out their things. 
your suppliers want to be paid, the co your your te your landlord wants to get paid, and all of those. Things. So there are many things that you need to do that are outside of your job description, and if you're not going to take it seriously by making sure that your team performs, um, and they can't give a cogent reason, of course you must follow due process in trying to rehabilitate the situation. But if you can't, again following appropriate process, you need to ask them to leave. But for me, that we need to have that conversation say what are the issues is it a training issue is it that it's not working for you because of personal circumstances whatever the reason it doesn't really matter but if you can't resolve it then maybe the organization you're working for is not for you and another one will be better so it's like a, a thing of water bottle of water yeah buy a bottle of water at a retailer maybe 10 rent go buy it at a high-end restaurant the same water you're paying 30 40 rents you know so why is that really change if it's the same commodity? It's the environment it's in. So that's okay. how we deal with it. And that's what I'm saying. We're not firing you. We're releasing you to find your destiny. <laughs> that's what we're doing. Yeah. Do you say those words to the person? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I said it to them. One left and they thought I was going to be upset. And I said, no, you're released for your destiny. And uh, we'll even get you a reference letter if you want to. <laughs> a very good one. No, we wrote it. We were honest. We're not going to embellish anything. But it was an honest, it was an honest one. And they got the job. And from my understanding, they're doing well where they are. Okay. Beautiful. All right. So how would you describe the day of a, what a day looks like for a CEO typically? I know it changes depending on the organizations, but some of the... At work key, or leaving to work let's, when you get to let's, the office? Let's balance both sides. Okay, so, so you pull it up at about three in the morning. <laughs> Come <laughs> on. No, no, seriously, you're probably sleeping at about 10 o'clock at night. Okay. We have probably about five hours sleep. I'm just talking about during the week, not the weekends. Yeah. And the reason being is that you need to catch up on your emails before you get to the office. Uh, and then from the, because the emails, then you know, you need to then know what you then delegate to mm. your respective uh, colleagues. Uh, there's some instances where people might need direction, guidance, because remember you've been, you've been given delegated authority by the organization. So they may be technically able to make a, dis uh, a call, but they don't have the organizational power and authority to do so. So you go through your emails early so that you're not a bottleneck to where they need uh, assistance uh, from you. So uh, you're doing this what time? So about 3 o'clock in the morning, you start your going through your That's email. what you're doing? Yeah. 3 a.m.? Yeah, 3 a.m. You must wake up and send emails or WhatsApp. <laughs> so I'd have, I'd have a WhatsApp group with my management team, and I'd send them emails at WhatsApp at 3, 2, if I, uh, sometimes 2 if I can't sleep. But I said, I'm not asking you to respond at 2 o'clock in the morning unless you're up. Right? So, so I'm just sending it so that you are aware of what is happening right? when you wake up. Because if I forget and then remember at 11 o'clock, Maybe by the time you sit, because you're in meetings all day, already a day is lost. You know what I mean? So that's why so you're waking up at about three o'clock in the morning. Do those particular emails. Uh, give instructions to your PA slash office manager to mm -hmm. for some of the work they may need to do to help you, as well to do follow ups and all of that. Um, you need to then review some of the documents that you need to uh, respond to. Uh, take a shower. <coughs> um, this is round about uh, what four. No, no, so no, no, so about probably two hours. Probably about two hours doing the work. Mm. So at about five o'clock, if you gym, you gym, you run, you run, take a shower, get the kids help, wake up the kids, they get ready for school, drop them off at school, go to the office. Because remember, once you hit the office, your time is not your time anymore. Mm. Because a colleague is going to come, sorry, CEO, I just want to ask you something quickly. What do you think about this? And you now need to show up. They've got a bad day. Maybe their cat is sick. <laughs> or, you know, they had a fight with their partner. Uh, their marriage is on the skids, whatever the case may be. You now need to be able to, you know, inspire mm. them to work. <laughs> and you've got your own problem. But you, you can't say, sort of, had a bad day and all of that jazz. Then you've got a number of meetings during the day. So... I, how I like to do my weeks is that I like to start Monday as a management meeting where we get updates on. So obviously we've broken down our annual targets quarterly and monthly. Where are we, what are the issues, updates and all of that and give direction when direction needs to be sorted. By 12 o'clock we're done, then we go do client engagement. So meet with client and uh, clients, stakeholders um, within the company, outside the company and all of that. So you are setting all your meetings and engagements after 12? 
Yeah, outside of the office, so on Monday. So Mondays, I'd make sure that it's dedicated to my management team. Um, and then afterwards, then after lunch, then to meet clients, which will then spill over maybe into sometimes um, late uh, or early evening um, engagements with clients um, and, and okay. stakeholders. Yeah. So that's how a typical day is, you know. It would um, end what time on average for you? So typically 7, 8 o'clock. PM. Yeah, 7. 3 a.m. to 7 p.m. Yeah. Yeah. Then have a little bit of time with the kids. Then you <laughs> there, you there's no time for the kids. Eh? Remember, that's why I said that your time stopped. And that's why part of the learnings is to then be intentional. To say, if I'm going to work like this, we must say maybe it's Monday to Wednesday. Thursday, 4 o'clock, I knock off. Um, because you can create the culture you want as a CEO. And I think that, you know, people talk about a work-life balance, right? And I, I don't know what a work-life balance is. If you've got, if, I hope you'll have a podcast on this mm. from people who've learned how to master it. But what I've learned and what I said to you earlier is that I take afternoon naps and I, I put them in my diary. I'm going to sleep. And I literally sleep. I put the phone on to not disturb, put my covers on and I sleep. Uh, and then just an alarm to wake me up after an hour and I proceed. I will not take a meeting on that time because I need, to, I need time for myself so that I'm able to give time um, that's where I'm present to my loved ones, mm. you know? Um, so, so for me is that the, the work-life balance, whatever works for you, is that you need to make sure that you've got time for yourself and your family, and you structure your appointments such that um, your, your, your family's got the best of you as well. Because at the end of the day, when you retire, or if you get fired, or you get released to your destiny. <laughs> you released. Your company is not going to be there for you. It's your family and friends. So you need to make sure you make time for them. So that's vitally important that I would argue that uh, you will build that into your diary up front. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're not the CEO yet, it's good because you can create that culture you want. If you're already the CEO, make sure that your diary permits you to have that because if you're not going to have it, you'll find that you'll come to the end of your professional life Beautiful house and send her 60 million rands, Range Rovers, Rolls Royces, nice balance sheet, but you won't have a family at the end of the day. And what are we doing this thing for? It's not just our egos, but it's also for our families as well. Beautiful, man. Last question. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Your lessons and tips and hacks around networking. Yeah. This one you can't avoid. Yes. You've already said you are doing stakeholder engagements. <laughs> so you've learned how to make networking work. Sure. And one of the things you've already said again is since you started your business, it's yeah. been fairly comfortable growing it because it's easy for you to access some stakeholders. You've yeah. been a CEO before. Sure, sure. Yeah, and a stakeholder manager before. And a stakeholder <laughs> manager before. So yeah. what, what does that look like when it's done well? So... Um, I'll answer the first, que the second question, or the first one later. So, around stakeholders, that you need to do research on who your stakeholders are, and know why are they important to your organization first, right? Because you're meeting them in the interest of your organization. That's why you're meeting them, right? Yeah. So you need to understand. So once you understand that, it makes it easier to then do the uh, mapping and the prioritization, and what are you going to have a conversation with them about? But also listen, so, and it's also important to listen. Right? So listen to say, um, what, do they, what value can they offer? Because there could be business opportunities that they bring that you've never, your organization has never thought about, or mm. solutions that could enhance your offering and your services could become more profitable for the business. Okay. Um, so that's why it then becomes very, very important. And part of, in order to be able to do that, is to do your research. So if I'm going to meet in Dando, I need to know who is in Dando. Mm. And technology has helped us. LinkedIn has helped us. Articles, just a Google search. You don't even need to get a professional entity to do the base search that you want to do. You know, so so for me, um, doing research about the client, understand when you're meeting them at a place. Ask them. So why are you here? What brought you to this particular platform where I'm meeting? And the person will tell you, I'm here because of this, that, and the other. And say, so, oh, okay, that's interesting. This is what I do. Um, or, and as a result, and this is obviously a new client. So listen, I'd be interested in having a further conversation. So a lot of business development uh, executives don't want to listen. They think they, they want to force <laughs> down a product down your throat or a service. 
and you should be uh, for, you should be listening to a person so that you can formulate a solution for them, but also they can formulate a solution for you. And so active listening is probably one of the most I would put it as number one skill that you need to have as a stakeholder manager. Then number two is project management because there's so many issues that are going to come up. You need to be able to put them in a project, a project management approach to realize the solutions that come up. Thirdly, you need to be able to write. Because you need to be able to write. I had a discussion in Tando, I had a conversation in Tsarello. Okay. This is what came out. Right? So that's what's important. Then in terms of networking, so you're writing, taking notes. Taking notes. What is mental notes? That you could you write it on your phone? Yes, three or four points, right? Because those three or four points help you when I meet you six months' time in Nigeria and we're there for a similar platform. Say, oh, Ntando, remember we met in Tanzania and you're looking at setting up a business coaching uh, mm. business uh, for fintech businesses in Kenya. How's that going? Have you found new opportunities? Or oh, listen, you know what? I just, bumped be... in, I just found this guy. I just bumped into this guy from Nigeria. And this is what he set up a hub here with a big university in Nigeria. And the government of Nigeria is going to give him money. Um, I think you can have a chat with him and see what you can lessons you've got from Kenya and how you guys can partner. Now I'll add value to you. And that's why I get now thing. how that would be such so, a powerful conversation. You know, so then, then, because then it's no longer cold. And like, how did you remember that? I met you six <laughs> months ago and I've never <laughs> talked since then. You know what I mean? And that's why a CRM, then you put it into a CRM at the end of yeah. the day. And when you go to a networking platform, say, who are the people going to be there? Who are the companies mm, going to be Just right? punch their what name, the notes pop up. Yeah, so people just rock up and just get a suit and just someone walk in. No, prepare. Why am I going here? What's the crowd? What positions are they in? And then you do the research. Then you know. Then you made, And when you write things down, you remember them. I, I, I don't know the neuroscience behind it, but I mm. found that it works. And it's the same thing with stakeholder relations and networking. And then the ability to find, and remember I talked about creating value, yeah. how we've created value. You've gone to Kenya, you've started something in Kenya, mm-hmm. I meet somebody in Nigeria at a similar conference who's doing this thing, you're doing that, I'm able to plug you guys, I've created value. What have I now done? So, okay, gentlemen and, or lady and gentlemen or ladies, here's a business opportunity. Where are we going to raise the capital for this? Okay, I've got capital here, I can get capital there. Uh, I want a capital raise. I want an introductory fee and an equity stake. <laughs> I've created value. Yeah. Out of nothing. Out of You've this. created value. I've created value. You hooked me already. And now you guys are both willing to pay. Mm, true. And we would. And we that's would. what it's all about so, at the end of the day. And networking, how does this translate to how to do networking? You, I think you've partly Part, answered. So within the networking, again, it's the same thing. Be deliberate and be intentional around the people that you want to meet. Why are you meeting them? And what do you seek to get out of them? And what, not in a transactional manner, but in a way that also adds value to your business, you are mm-hmm. at a personal level, and also for them as well at the end of the day. Because people will be drawn to you if you add value. If you don't add value, they're not going to be drawn to you. Why do you think people want to go meet uh, a president or a CEO of a company? Because they know that this person can give them value at the end of the day. So within that, you should be able to be, able to be seen as somebody who is plugged in um, and somebody who's unable to help people solve problems mm. at the end of the day. So that's your approach to networking. Understand what people do, why they do it, and what drives them at the end of the day. You know, getting personal anecdotes is important, right? So, obviously, if I know that you're a big soccer fan and Kizzy Chief lost, <laughs> I'm not going to ask you how's Kizzy Chief <laughs> doing. But uh, if you're a Man City fan, yeah. as an example, and Man City had a tough game and they won it, I want to say, hey, man, your team really played very well over the weekend, you know. Um, I liked uh, how they played and how they held out against a smaller team. Yeah. But they showed grit and tenacity. It was not the best game, but they played well, you know. So once they, once you bring that in, it's a nice icebreaker at the mm. end of the day. And also be able to manage the relationship. That be able to call a guy. How's it doing? I saw an article on this thing. I thought you may find it interesting. So there you go. Those little things help. Know when their birthdays are. Even if you send them a happy birthday message or happy anniversary message on LinkedIn and all of those things, it breaks the ice in the conversations that you're having. Um, so it's not always about seeking a commercial outcome immediately. 
Many of the relations that have helped me in my business today are relations that I've built 10, 15 years ago and mm -hmm. are coming to fruition now from a commercial perspective or people linking me up with others. So always see you sustain them be, be, be authentic and be genuine because people people can read that energy that this guy just wants a deal and the thing's being transactional, right? Mm -hmm. So if I can help, and I've helped people on once of deals and I didn't get anything, these are the now people for me six years later say, Leo, uh, I had your number, somebody else had your number, now I got your number from this person. Please, man, I've been looking for this thing. Can you help me? Or oh, this person needs help, and I think you're the right person to, 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 to help them. So authenticity is key. Don't look at people as stepping stones to your way to the top, but see them as an ecosystem that will help you to hunt. Um, the, the largest uh, animals in the world are in the ocean, whales and the like. Mm -hmm. um, so the apex predators, in my logic, have to be the ones in the ocean because they're the largest. <laughs> and, the large, and the apex predator is not the great white shark. It's the killer whale. Mm. Uh, and the killer whale hunts in a pod. It's a pack. Mm. And they even kill uh, great white sharks. So the point that I'm making is that um, you need to hunt in a pack and mm. work within an ecosystem. Leverage people who are smarter than you. So I don't like to be the smartest person in a room. I don't like that. If I'm, okay. in, if I'm the smartest, I quickly leave, leave that room. Mm -hmm. um, I want to be around people who are smarter than me, who are more knowledgeable than me, because that's how I learn. Uh, by nature, I'm very inquisitive. And I'll go, uh, don't be scared. You know, Go meet someone and say, hi, how's it? This is my name. I'm from here. What's your name? Mm -hmm. If they say, please get out of my space, it doesn't leave you in a worse off position. And interesting enough, you'll find those are some of your biggest contacts that you have met uh, through okay. through such uh, actions. Yeah. What's your thoughts around two challenges that I see people having when it comes to this? Yeah. One, collecting business cards in networking sessions and never following up. And the sure. second <laughs> one being you want to network and talk to this person but you feel the power imbalance is so wide, the gap, you can't see how you can be valuable to them, although you are clear about how they can be valuable to you, so it scares you to the point of not even trying. Okay. Because I want to talk to you, and I know what value you give to me, but I feel I'm too small to be of any value to you. How do I begin that conversation? Okay, so first one is that uh, one I've never, well, I've had business cards, but I, I didn't like business cards. <laughs> I never collect a business card if I have no intention of following up. And uh, where people have given me business cards, even if I didn't ask for the business card, I'd always write an email to them at the end of the day. Say, dear whomever, thank you for the meeting. It was good to chat to you about one, two, and three. Mm. I see this what your company offers. We're not on the mar in the market at the stage for those particular services. But please hit me up next year around about this time when we do our stretch review. It may that that opportunity may pop up. Yeah. And typically, that come back and say thank you. So I would discourage anyone who does that. If you have no intention, don't take the card. And it's not rude to take that. Um, rather, just say no, thank you. Whatever the case may be, that's number one. The number two, as I've mentioned, so. If, if, if I know that, let's just say I want to do something with MTN and I can see how MTN can add value to me, I need to be able to frame the problem that uh, MTN is solving. For, and I'm just using MTN as an example. Yeah. I'm not trying to market MTN and your podcast. Yeah. Um, I would then say to MTN, MTN, if you partner with me in solving this problem, this is the opportunity it provides you as an organization at the end of the day. Mm. And although my request may be small, because you mentioned a power imbalance, maybe yeah. commercially small for you, but it provides an opportunity to prove the concept where the cost of it not working is fairly minimal. But if it works, the benefits are bigger because your target adjustable market is this big. And we estimate that you could make so much mm. when you're doing it this way. Because if you're not solving a problem for me, why should, I, why should I solve a problem for you? <laughs> I mean, think about it. So I've told the CEO's time stops. If I'm going yeah. to meet the CEO of MTN uh, at the airport yeah. on his way to somewhere, and I've got a minute with him in the lift, I must be able to give him uh, or maybe 90 seconds for the elevator pitch, as they say. 
yeah. I'm not self-sufficient, something that will be able to hook, that he says I'm interested. But that interest is not a, is doing me a favor, but he sees a value for his business. Mm. And if you're not able to frame that, that's why you're going to be scared. But if you know that you've got a solution for him, you know, so if I can say to the CEO of MTN, I've got a solution that can solve your average revenue per user, and this is it. I'm like, okay, what are you saying? <laughs> and I said, da, da, da. I said, no, no, listen, my man, where are you going to now? I said, no, I, I just saw in the left cap. I don't know, listen, I'm flying to Cape Town. Don't you want to fly with me to Cape Town? <laughs> I'll pay for your flight to Devon <laughs> because you're adding value. And he wants the two hours with you because you're going to solve a problem for him. Right? Even if he's paying from his own card, it's fine. Whether he claims it or not, it's neither here mm. nor there. But the issue is that you need to be able to solve a problem uh, for the person that you're asking for help for. Otherwise, then it becomes charity. And we know that there's donor fatigue. I'm not saying charities are wrong or bad, no. But donor fatigue kicks in. Because the guy's are like, but now, why, why am I actually doing this? Because it's going to take time. There's no right to submission, onboard this guy. And I'm not seeing the value that he or she is adding to me. Mm. But if I see the value... And then I can bring the organizational influence and resources to support you in what you, are, in what you want to do. So it's important to be able to package your ideas in a way that um, are sellable and somebody wants to buy them. And the only way you do that is uh, being able is doing your research and packaging them properly. Mm -hmm. So if I know that I'm going to meet the CEO of MTN uh, or ta of Vodacom, let's also mention yeah. Vodacom and <laughs> I need to know what's keeping him or those CEOs awake at night. So when I meet them, I've already packaged it and I can sell it because sometimes a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It is. And if you're going to say, eh, can I get your email? When can I come and see you? Eh, <laughs> and you're like that. And the guy will just maybe give you his card politely and say, phone my PA. He'll set up something. She'll set up something. Or he'll set up something. The PA is going to say, Kano, man. Who are you, Chief? What do you want? <sighs> yeah, it's fine. We'll get to it. But if you are clear, he'll be the one phoning the PA then. Mm -hmm. Say, PA, listen, I'm with this guy. I want the meeting here. Oh, okay, get him on. To, do you have a passport? Yes. Do they need a visa <laughs> then? No. Sharp, let's go. We'll pay the flight. We'll fly back. Because we've got a solution. We've got a solution that adds value. Find that's what's what, keeping them up at, at night. night. And always, that's why I talked about the importance of knowing how to create a value. Not the money. With all what said, so I blew it. Mm. People got millions. They finished because they didn't have a wealth mindset. They didn't know how mm. to create value. We'll get into that one. I think the next shoot, you promised you'll do the next shoot by the beach somewhere in some That's fine. country. Maybe somewhere. somewhere. Um, I hope, <laughs> I hope, I hope uh, you'll be there so we can do the shot there. Yeah. And take it from there. Yeah. Let's pick it up from there. Thank you. So that will be our part two. Yeah, <laughs> so this, will be this is a good part one. This okay, is sure. a good warm up. So, if you are enjoying conversations with the CEO, let me know. Pop some questions that you want to ask uh, Olio, and I have him next on on the show, and we'll be sure to ask him. Thank you for hanging there still this time. If you are watching till this point, you're clearly enjoying the content. If you're not subscribed, do the YouTube thing and click those buttons. But from our side, see you on the next episode.